Zin. Mr. Chairman and my dear brothers and sisters, the subject about Muhammad in the Bible, a few decades back when I started prying into this field of biblical prophecies, I started discussing with learned men of Christianity, asking them the question whether the Bible had anything to say about Muhammad. And invariably, every learned man of Christianity says, no, there's nothing in the Bible about Muhammad. And if there was such a thing, he said, we would have known it. One gentleman, a 70-year-old man, he said, my son, at that time I was quite young, he said, my son, I have been reading the Bible for the past 50 years. And if Muhammad was mentioned anywhere, naturally I would have known it. So I asked him, are there not hundreds of prophecies in the Old Testament regarding the coming of Jesus Christ? So a Dumini, a priest who happened to be there at the time, he said, not hundreds but thousands. That there are thousands of prophecies in the Old Testament regarding the coming of Jesus Christ. So I asked him, out of these thousand prophecies that you are talking about, is there a single prophecy where Jesus is mentioned by name? That the name of the Messiah, Messiah is not a name. It is a title. Like the mayor of the town, like the king of the country, as like the president, as like the headmaster, the chairman, these are titles. These are not names. Christ is not a name. Prophet, the word prophet is not a name. These are states, it's a status. So Christ is not a name. The name is Jesus. When the child was born, the Bible says, he was named Jesus by the angel before he was in his mother's womb. What was he named? Jesus, not Christ. Christ is the title. So I said, is there a single place in the Old Testament where Jesus is mentioned by name? That the name of the Messiah will be Jesus. His mother's name will be Mary. His supposed father will be Joseph the carpenter. And he'll be born in Bethlehem in the reign of Herod the king. Is there any such thing? He says, no. He says, how do you know? That there are thousands of prophecies. He said, no. Prophecies are word pictures of something that is going to happen in the future. Word pictures. And when those things actually happen, come to pass, you conclude, you deduce that this is the fulfillment of that. So I said, you reason, you deduce to discover Christ in the Old Testament. He said, yes. So I said, why should you not do the same about Muhammad? Out of a thousand, you can't find a single one with a name. Why are you demanding that I should show you Muhammad spelled out? M-U-H-U-M-M-E-D or any variation of spellings. Why? But later on, as I gained experience, I discovered that Muhammad is mentioned by name. In the Bible. It is in the original language. In Hebrew. It is in the Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 6, where it says, Hikko mamittakim vi kullo muhammadim zahdudi vi zahri baynat Jerusalem. In the Hebrew, original manuscripts, it is still there today. Every Hebrew Bible has it. Chapter 5, verse 6 of the Song of Solomon. The word there is muhammadim. They have translated that word muhammadim as altogether lovely. Now when you say, that my beloved is altogether lovely, you don't know he's talking about Muhammad. See, altogether lovely. Like instead it was written, my beloved is the praised one. He said, anyone could be praised one. He says, no, the Muhammad translated means the praised one. But you can't see Muhammad there. It's praised one, praised one, praised one. Similarly, altogether lovely, altogether lovely. You're reading altogether lovely. But what's the original? Is Muhammad Im. Muhammad Im is a plural of respect in Hebrew. 
and people seem to have misunderstood that. The Western nations, they see plurality of numbers where plurality of respect is intended. Like in the first verse of the Christian Bible, in the Jewish Bible, the book of Genesis, the first book, chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The word God in Hebrew is Elohim. El in Hebrew means God. Elah in Hebrew means God. Elohim is a plural of respect. Where the Christians read Father, Son and Holy Ghost. In the mind when they say Elohim, they say it's Father, Son and Holy Ghost is intended. When it says God said, let us create man, they think that us is Father, Son and Holy Ghost. But ask the Jew. Any Jew. Who is this us? He says, no, it's a plural of respect. Who is im? He says it's a plural of respect. In every Eastern language, we have two types of plurals. Plural, plural of numbers and plural of respect. Arabic, Hebrew, Urdu, Gujarati, every Eastern language has it. If you haven't got it in your language, you are just unfortunate. See, like the royal we. When the Queen of England, she declares that we have decreed such and such. Who is this we? Ask her. She, her husband and her son? No. Or the Prime Minister? No. We is a plural of respect. They call it the royal we. In religion like Hebrew and Arabic, in these languages, we read in the Quran, same type of plural for God. I quote, Inna nahnu nazzalna dhikra wa inna lahu lahafizun. Inna most certainly we Nahnu nazzalna dhikra, it is we who send down the message, the revelation, and it is for us to protect it. Who is this us? Allah, Muhammad and Jibreel? No. No Arab Christian ever points a finger at the Arab Muslim to say, who is this us and who is this we? He'll be a fool to do such a thing because he knows that this in his language is a plural of respect. Im in Hebrew is a plural of respect. Elohim or Muhammadim, plural of respect. The word Muhammad is there. Which they translated, I said this is the game that they play. They translate when it suits them. They translate names of people which you have no right to do. And once you do that, you miss the mark, the whole thing is lost. Fortunately, some of these translations with the originals are still retained. Like the word Messiah. In the Bible, you'll find the word Messiah as well as Christ. Christ is a translation, so we know this is, Christ is the translation of the word Messiah. Peter. Peter. You see, one of the disciples of Jesus, the foremost, who was given the, that duty of feeding, Jesus says, feed my sheep, means my followers, feed my lambs, meaning my, my followers. Feed them means look after them, guard them, cherish them. So, you say Peter, says, Jesus said, you read in some translations, thou art Peter, and on this rock I'll build my church. Thou art Peter. Jesus never heard the word Peter in his life. As the word Christ he never heard in his life. He never heard the word Jesus in his life. Believe me. This word Jesus was unknown to him. When he was born, his mother didn't call him Jesus. She called him Yeshua. Common name Esau. E-S-A-U. Esau. We say Esau. In Afrikaans they say Jesus. I say that because there's some couple of South Africans here, so they know what I'm talking about. Jesus, Isa in Arabic, Esau in Hebrew, classical Yeshua. That's what she called him. She named him Yeshua, a form of Joshua. Joshua translated, they translate Joshua, Yeshua to Joshua. So Jesus is the Latinized form of the Hebrew word Isa, Esau, Latinized. So when it is Latinized, you can't think you're talking about a Jew. Because the Western nations, they didn't want to worship a Jew as a God. You see, so when you say Jesus, it sounds Roman or Greek. When you say Christ, it seems like Roman or Greek. It doesn't sound Jew. Peter sounds Roman or Greek. Paul sounds Roman or Greek. 
They have been twisting, translating names, changing pronunciation. Jesus said in his own Hebrew tongue, he said, Thou art Kephas. Simon, Simon was his name. Thou art Kephas. And on this Kephas, on this rock, I'll build my church. Kephas in Hebrew means a rock or stone. Translated into Greek, Petros. Petros means rock or stone, from which we get the word Peter. You see? So we have Saint Peter in Rome. It should be Saint Simon in Rome, or Saint Kephas in Rome. But Peter sounds Greek, Roman. They translated it. Peter never heard the word Peter in his life. Jesus never heard the word Jesus in his life. Jesus Christ never heard the word Christ in his life. See, this is the psychology of subject peoples, suffering from inferiority complexes. You like to make the names, your name sound like that of your rulers. Saint Paul, the self-appointed 13th disciple of Jesus, self-appointed. He is no Paul, he's Saul. On the Damascus road, Jesus addresses him in the Hebrew tongue. He says, Saul, Saul. He didn't say Paul, Paul. Why persecutest thou me? Why kickest thyself against the pricks? He said, Saul, Saul. Saul sounds Jewish. So they changed to Paul. Paul sounds Roman or Greek. And this is a continuous sickness. Changing names of people. You know, pronunciation of Hebrew names. Yusuf, they turn to Joseph. Jacob, they say Jacob. Yunus, they say Jonah. Isa is a Jesus. See, where there's no J, they put J. Everywhere where there's no J, they put J. In my country, they are, people are charged for jaywalking. These people are jaywalking into religion. You say jaywalking. You know what is jaywalking? You say, you have these traffic crossings. You know those yellow zebra stripes that you're supposed to cross there. And if you don't, in my country, if you're in the main streets, if you cross anywhere else, and if the policeman is on the other side, he will charge you for jaywalking. These people have jaywalked into religion. Where no J, they put J, 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 and now, you know, Jesus and Jesus, Isa. They did the same thing to Muhammad. Same thing. In the verses I read to you just now from Surah Saf, chapter 61, verse 6, Jesus is made to say, وَإِذَا قَالَ عِيسَى بْنُ مَرْيَمَ He says, Behold, Jesus, the son of Mary, said, يَا بَنِ إِسْرَائِيلَ O children of Israel, إِنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَيْكُمْ Most certainly, I am the messenger of God sent to you all. Who? The Jews, Bani Israel, sent to you. مُصَدِّقًا لِمَا بَيْنَ يَدَيَّ مِنَ التَّوْرَاتِ Confirming the revelation which came before me. As he says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am come not to destroy but to fulfill. He's confirming the law that which came before him. And giving glad tidings of a messenger to come after me whose name shall be Ahmad, which is another name for Muhammad. Ahmad and Muhammad are synonymous terms. Coming from the word hamd means praised. Muhammad, Ahmad, both have the word hamd in praised one. Which they say altogether lovely. But now this is what Jesus is supposed to have said according to the text of the Holy Quran. But when we search the Bible, we don't find the word there. We don't find Ahmad, we don't find Muhammad. What happened? Same. They have been translating names. So you can't find it anymore. But, I said, let us go to the Gospel of St. John. Gospel of St. John, chapter 16, verse 7. Where it says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, Jesus is speaking. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I go, I will send him. And when he's come, he will convict the world in respect of sin and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not in me, and so on and so on. The word he uses there is the word comforter. 
that the one that is coming, he must go. If he doesn't go, the other won't come. And that one who is coming, his name is Comforter in the English language, in the English Bible, or Counselor, or Advocate. Different, different Bibles. Advocate, Counselor, Comforter. So you say, where is Muhammad? I don't see Muhammad there. Comforter. But I says, you know, in the Afrikaans language, I read Afrikaans a little bit of the Bible. It says it's very beautiful. You know, the Afrikaans is so beautiful for this prophecy. Unfortunately, you know, except for two, I think, two or more persons, uh, you don't know the language, but you will appreciate, you'll be able to see something here in the pronunciation, the word, the language itself, that in this prophecy there's something definite, some definiteness, definiteness is, is proved. It says, Mar exa yella di var hate. Dit is for yella fuer de licht dat ek weg gaan. Want as ek nie weg gaan nie, sal die trooster nie na yella kom nie. Four negatives in one verse, one sentence. No language on earth has that. Afrikaans is the youngest of the world's languages. It's unique. Every language is unique. But this is more unique than more others. Four negatives in one sentence to prove a positive. That if I don't go, he won't come. I must go before he comes. <laughs> no language does that. Four times, no, 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 no. Just say, yes, yes, yes. Believe me. <laughs> so, the word there is truester. So I'm asking the Christian, did Jesus speak English? Did he say comforter? He says, no. Did he speak Afrikaans? He says, no. So he didn't use the word truster. In Zulu, he says, he says, um, towazi, you see. I said, did you speak Zulu? In the Zulu Bible. He says, no. In the Arabic language, in the Arabic Bible, it says, lakinni akulu lakum al-haq, innahu khairu lakum. An antalika, li annahu in lam antalik, la yatikum al-mu'azzi. Walakin in zahabtu ursilhu ilaykum. He uses the word mu'azzi. I said, did you speak Arabic? Jesus. No. So, he didn't say Mu'azzi. In two, the Bible, the New Testament is now translated into 2,000 different languages. And there are 2,000 different names. What did he say? There are 2,000 different candidates, can't you see? Because you have been translating one language to another, every language you're translating. You say Mu'azzi in Arabic, you say Mpogazi in Zulu, you say Trusted in Afrikaans, you say Comforter in English, come on, come on. Every language has got a different word, different name. So what are we to do? He said, the only alternative left to us is to reason, to deduce. We are asking them now, the Christian, who is this comforter or truester or umtovaz, you see, or muazzi? Oh, they say it's the Holy Ghost. They say, and this is universal, all Christians say it's the Holy Ghost. I said, you see, here, Jesus is making a condition. The condition is, he says, if I go not away, the comforter will not come. It's conditional. If I don't go, he won't come. But if I go, I will send him. But the coming of the Holy Ghost, according to the Christian scriptures, is not conditional. And I give you proof. Look. The Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 1, verse 41. You read there. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost long before Jesus was born. Elizabeth, mother of John the Baptist, Yahya alayhi salam, she had the Holy Ghost before Jesus was born. So it's not conditional that Jesus must go before the Holy Ghost comes. If it's the Holy Ghost, then this doesn't apply to him because the Holy Ghost was there with Elizabeth. And it says again, And John the Baptist, Yahya alayhi salam, had the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb before he was born. This Holy Ghost was inside his mother's womb. They came out together. What that means, I don't know. You see, this Holy Ghost was with John the Baptist from his mother's womb. Or as soon as he was born, the Holy Ghost came with him. So, Jesus says, if I don't go, he won't come. 
But before he is born, the Holy Ghost is there. Then Jesus says, Matthew chapter 12, verse 28, He said, but if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, ask the Christian, who is the Spirit of God? He says, the Holy Ghost. See, when it suits them, they translated spirit. When it suits them, they translated ghost. In Greek, there is no such word as ghost and spirit, two different words. They haven't got it. They say pneuma. Pneuma means you translate it when it suits you, ghost. And when it suits you, you say spirit. Who is the spirit? The Holy Ghost. So Jesus, he says, I cast out devils. With the help of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. So, it was not necessary for him to go before the Holy Ghost comes. See, he was helping him. And it was also, this Holy Ghost was helping his disciples because we are told. He said, when you go out and people confront you and when you speak, it is not ye who speak, but it is the Holy Ghost that's making you to speak. His disciples. So the Holy Ghost was with his disciples. They were helping the disciples in the mission of preaching and healing before Jesus departed. So it's not the Holy Ghost. Then Jesus, in John chapter 20, verse 22, he says, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. He's offering the disciples. Before he departed, he said, Receive, take it. So when he said, Receive, take it, either they received or they didn't. Either he was bluffing or he was giving them that gift. And we are asking the Christian, Was he bluffing them? I said, Here, look, here's 10 francs. Am I really giving you or playing fools with you? You know, I'm playing fools with you. I said, take it, take it, take it. And there's nothing there in my hand. What did Jesus do? Say, he said, receive, and he didn't give. So he says, you see, this comforter is not the Holy Ghost. Because the coming of the comforter is dependent upon Jesus departing, but the coming of the Holy Ghost is not dependent upon anybody's coming or going. Then in John, chapter 16, Verse 12, 13, and 14, we read there. Jesus says, I have yet many things to say unto you. Many things to say unto you. But ye cannot bear them now. Meaning you haven't got that capacity. I can give you a solution to your problems till doomsday, Yawm al Qiyamah. But how can I give you when you haven't got the understanding, the capacity? He speaks to his disciples, uh, reproaches them again and again. He says, ye of little faith, ye of little faith, you got no faith, no iman. Without iman, very little iman. How many times? Dozens of times. Then he explains to them, like explaining to little children. And they can't seem to understand what he's talking about. So he says, are you even yet without understanding, yet? And when he's provoked further, he says, Oh, faithless and perverse generation. This is addressing his own disciples. Not the generality of Jews. He called them harder names than that. See, Oh, faithless and perverse generation. How long shall I be with you? How long shall I be with you? I say, if Jesus was a Japanese instead of a Jew, he would have committed that honorable harakiri. You know, suicide. But as a Jew, he loved life dearly. He is provoked by his own disciples endlessly. So naturally he says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. How be it? When he, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. He is now speaks about the spirit of truth. He will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak from himself. But what things soever shall he hear, that shall he speak. And he shall declare unto you the things that are to come. He shall glorify me. We are asking, who is the spirit of truth? They say the Holy Ghost. Again, is the Holy Ghost the spirit of truth? We said, you see, this prophecy, John chapter 16, verses 12, 13, and 14, if I reread with a little emphasis on the pronouns, you will see that Jesus is not speaking about a spirit, a ghost, a spook. He's speaking about a man. Listen. Jesus says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. How be it? When he, 
the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak from himself. But what things so shall he hear, that shall he speak, and he shall declare unto you the things that are to come, he shall glorify me. Eight masculine pronouns in one verse. Ill, it be, Ill befits a spirit, a ghost or a spook. You agree? He, 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 he. A spirit or a ghost or a spook will be it, it, it. Not he, he, he. Now when this thing was stressed in, 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 in the undivided India, you know, India and Pakistan is one piece, the Christian missionaries, they changed this verse in the Urdu Bible to she, 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 she. So Muslims can't say that Muhammad was a she. But if it's he, it's, 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 it can be Muhammad. So, no, no, no. so they change it to she, 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 she. Very, very convenient. Very, very easy. Very easy. Now let's analyze this. Jesus said, I have yet many things to say unto you. Many in English means more than one. I won't say how many. It means more than one. And he will guide you into all truth. All also means more than one. Simple English. All, many means more than one. And for 40 years, I'm asking learned men of Christian, then, I said, look, I want you to give me one new thing that the Holy Ghost gave any church in 2,000 years. In South Africa, among the whites of South Africa, there are a thousand different sects and denominations. One thousand and three thousand among the blacks. I said, this three thousand to one thousand. In any church, whether you are a Roman Catholic or an Anglican or a Presbyterian or a Lutheran or Mormon or Jehovah's Witness or Seventh-day Adventist, whatever you are, any church out of your thousand churches, and everyone says he's got the Holy Spirit, he's got the Holy Ghost, everyone got the Holy Ghost. I said, now give me one new thing that the Holy Ghost gave any church in two thousand years. One, only one. And believe me, in, two, in all these 40 years, I'm posing the question. Not one is forthcoming. Not one new thing. I said, we are faced with problems. 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 Surely the Holy Ghost can't be silent for 2,000 years. Jesus is going to guide you into all truth. Solve all your problems. He hasn't solved one. Not one. What does the Holy Ghost say about those 55 million drunkards in America? What does he say about the surplus women, 7.8 million who can't get husbands? Hmm? What does this Holy Ghost say about the problem of race in South Africa? I want to know. What did he tell you in 2000 years? Nothing. Nothing. Come to Muhammad. What do you want to know? You will find the answers. In the Quran, in the Hadith. To solve your problem. It might not go down well. It's human nature. You know, we get used to a certain type of life, behavior, and we don't want to change. We love to remain in the rut, groove. They say you get that groovy feeling. This is a type of lemonade they have now invented in South Africa. They call it groovy. So it gives you groovy feeling. You know groovy feeling? You get into the groove, and once you sleep in the groove, it gives you a comfortable feeling. It's a rut. Once you're in the rut, it's a small hole in which you know two tracks of wheels if they go they can't come out you keep to the rut it's like a rail but it's a hollow rail the difference between a rut and a grave is only depth a rut is one foot deep deep the other is six feet deep that's all. that's the only difference is the depth how much and it's a comfortable feeling in the groove once you are there you don't want to be disturbed nobody likes to be disturbed we are all like that we don't like to be disturbed so, I said, Islam gives you the answers. Bring your problems. It might not go down well, as I said. But you give an alternative to the solution that Islam offers. There isn't. Now, a problem is posed. Problem is posed. He said, look, is Muhammad a spirit? If it's not the ghost, all right. Is he a spirit? He said, no, he was a solid personality. He was flesh and blood. But here he says spirit. I said, you see the same John 
in the first epistle of John, chapter 4, verse 1, he says, He said, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. That's the same John. It's his own terminology. Many false prophets have gone out into the world. So a false prophet is a false spirit, a true prophet is a true spirit. The word spirit is used synonymously for a prophet by the same John. And the same John tells us that that which is born of spirit is spirit and that which is born of flesh is flesh. What is he talking about? Born of spirit is spirit. Do spirits cohabit? Do they? No. They don't have sexual relationship. You know, there's no female uh, spirit and female angel and male angel. Angel is angel. They are neuter. They are neither male nor female. They don't start cohabiting. They don't get married and start begetting children. Do they? No. In Christianity, do they? So no. Though they portray angels meaning beautiful women with wings. But angels are not beautiful women with wings. They are angelic. They are heavenly. They are spiritual beings. You know, they are neither male nor female. They have neither shape. They can materialize according to God's will into any form or shape. But they are neither this, this nor that. They are neither male nor female. And they don't cohabit. They don't beget. So how can spirits beget spirits? How can you be born of spirit? Because he that is born of flesh is flesh. He that is born of spirit is spirit. Now what it means is this, that if you are motivated by spiritual consideration, you are a spiritual person. If it is material consideration that brought you here, that you know, if I go to Mr. Dida's last meeting, you know, all the videotapes that will be left over, he'll give them out to the people, you know, in the front row. Then you see everybody clamoring to get into the front row. What is your consideration? Material. Incidentally, tonight is the last night you have a chance, if you haven't got them. The videotapes of this great debate that took place in America is there. And also an audio tape of an, an interview with Gina Lewis on your R70, Radio 74. That's five five francs there, uh, you'll enjoy it, five francs for the cassette tape, and the others are 75 francs for the two tapes, the two, uh, as I said. It's and there's the pamphlets are available in case you would write for free literature, you can also do that, the coupon is there. You can write to South Africa, inshallah we'll send it to you. So what was your consideration in coming here? If it was immaterial, consideration, intangible consideration, a nobler motive, then you are a spiritual person. If it was material consideration, Mr. Didat might give us five francs each or ten francs each for coming and attending his meeting and that's what brought you here, then you are a materialist. You are born of flesh, you are flesh. This material consideration, you are a materialist person. If you are born of spirit, you are spirit. Meaning that is your spiritual consideration make you spiritual. That's the language of the Bible. So, Muhammad is spirit. In other words, that his considerations are spiritual. And his title. He is a sadiq al Amin. Before his prophethood, this title was given by the mushriks of Makkah. And this title is preserved on his tomb. You'll find a plaque there which reads, La ilaha illallah, al malikul haqqul mubeen, Muhammadur Rasulullah, as sadiqul wadul ameen. This latter expression, as sadiqul wadul ameen, is not Quranic, it's not in the Quran. This is the tribute with the mushriks of Makkah, the pagans paid to Muhammad. As sadiqul wa'ad, the man who fulfills his promises. Al ameen, the truthful, the spirit of truth, the prophet of truth, that is Muhammad. And he guided mankind into all this. He shall glorify me. He will be a witness of me. He will testify of me. 
All these are the qualities of this one who is going to come. He will bear witness of me. He will testify of me. He will glorify me. Open the Quran. I was giving you references last night. That we in Islam are made to accept that Jesus Christ was born miraculously. As against what the Jews said, that he is the illegitimate child of Mary. As against what the Christians said, that he is the begotten son of God. The Muslim is made to say his true status, true position. That is true glory. If I pick up somebody here, anyway, and maybe I don't know the name of your king here or your ruler here, and I pick up a poor man, a sweeper, and he say you are the son of, say, Adolf Hitler. Well, let's say a good man. You are the son of, uh, I don't know, the name of your rulers in the world, you know, anybody, Zia ul Haq. You see? Now, if I said that, you know, if you are not, I'm actually insulting you. You know, I'm insulting you, you see? I must hold you for whatever you are. You are a lecturer in the school, or you are a janitor, or whatever you are, you are a caretaker, you are a supervisor, whatever position you occupy, that title I give you is respect. Anything beyond, or anything below, both are insulting. And people should have sense enough to know that. Like one French uh, plebeian, you know, rustic, farmer, young man, he came to Paris during the reign of one of the uh, French kings, you know, Louis, so and so, he was very fast and loose with women. Any woman he sees that's beautiful, he used to, also he didn't have a haram, but he used them. You see, the same way that is, he took, took them in. Very loose, fast and loose with any woman. One of the French kings. And his son, when he came to, in power, he became the king, some of this Louis so and so. And he heard that there is another young man about his age in Paris and he is identical to the young king. An exact duplicate. So he's became very inquisitive. He says, you know, people are mistaking him for you, your highness. He said, well, I'd like to see the fellow. And the guy said, search him out. So they got him and they brought him to the king, the young king. And the young king sees, he says, man, exact replica, identical, cent percent, like as if they were twins, identical twins. So he's asking this rustic farmer, he said, you know, during the reign of my father, did your mother ever visit Paris? He's insinuating that if your mother did, in case, you know, my father must have seen her and taken her into his harem. So, you and I, you know, we happen to be identical. So the young rustic says, no, says, my father didn't. I'm saying, my mother didn't, but my father did. <laughs> he did visit the party. Says, maybe, you know, my father was responsible for you. <laughs> now, says, it was an insult to tell him that you are, if your mother had come, that means, you know, you are my blood brother. You know, my father had planted seeds in both. He understands that this is no honor. This is an insult. He's insinuating this guy is a bastard. That's what he's trying to say, that you are a bastard. You know, my father must be responsible for you. He said, no, no, no. My father was responsible for you. No, man, you are a king. But you know, he said, no, my father did. He did come. I don't say what happened, what not. That I don't know. But my father did come. So true honor is, keep the man according to his status. What does he claim? He claims to be the Messiah. He claims to be the messenger of God. He claims to be the mouthpiece of God. He said, I by the finger of God cast out devils by God's power. You know, according to his directions. Not the finger taking God's finger and you know, trying to pry out devils from people. No, no, no. It means according to God's direction. Whatever God directs me to do, I do. He said, my father is greater than I. He said, my father is greater than all. He says, I can of my own self do nothing. That's true honor. Whatever he says, I can do of my own self, do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is righteous because I seek not my own will, but the will of him that sent me. This is his true position. He is the Messiah. He is the word which God bestowed upon Mary. He was born miraculously. He gave life to the dead by God's permission. He healed those born blind and the lepers by God's permission. Stay with that. Stay with that. Don't go beyond. As soon as you go beyond, 
This is no honor. This is an insulting thing, going to extremes. He is neither this nor that. He is a messenger of God. As I quoted you last night, that Quranic verse, telling the Jews and the Christians, La dinikum. Do not go to extremes in your religion. Don't go to extremes. So, Muhammad glorified Jesus, testified about him. He said, he shall not speak from himself, who the one that's coming. But what things shall he hear, that shall he speak. Where did Muhammad speak from? Where did he get his knowledge from? Allah tells us, وَمَا يَنْتِكُ عَنِ الْحَوَىٰ He does not speak from his own desire. إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْنُ يُوحَىٰ It is no less than an inspiration sent down to him. أَلَّمَهُ شَدِيدُ الْقُوَىٰ He is taught by one mighty power. His knowledge is not his. It is being given to him by inspiration. And Jesus said, For he shall not speak from himself on his own. You know, making up his own mind. You know, concocting his own theories, philosophies. No, no, no. Whatever is given to him, he gives it to you. What he hears, he conveys them to you. And you see, it fits, this prophecy fits our Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa like a glove. We don't have to stretch hook or by crook, somehow make him fit Muhammad. We don't have to do that. He will guide you into all truth. As I said, every problem, every problem besetting mankind, come, 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 ask. I will end with one example. I can give you many, but one example. And then I leave to you, my audience, to ask questions for further elucidation. You see, the late King Sobuza of Swaziland, he had eight wives, or nine wives. And his eldest wife, number one, she died. And when she died, there was a controversy in Swaziland. It's a small inland country, like Switzerland. Swaziland, Switzerland. It's about the same size. <laughs> the population is only about a million, Swaziland. You have about six million. Yes. The difference is in the population, but otherwise, Swaziland. King Subuza. So when his wife died, there was a controversy in the country. He says, now how long is a man to wait before he can remarry? Since the queen died, now how long is a man to wait? Suppose the woman is dead, your wife died, how long must you wait before you remarry? And the things started going around in the churches now. How long? And there's arguments going on, debates going on. But before long, this debate changed to how long is a woman. He said, look, the king has still got eight more wives. So it's not a problem. What are you worried about? Why controversy? Why wasting time, energy? Now let's talk, how long is a woman to wait if the husband dies? Controversy. All the churches, Roman Catholic Church, Anglican Church, the Jehovah's Witnesses, Assemblies of God. Shh. You just imagine the names that they are there. Among the Africans. And they're arguing and debating. So the king says, no, this is no good. I want to call up a synod. All the churches must get together now and discuss this, debate this. So there was a Swazi gentleman, Musa Borman. He died. May Allah give him Jannat. He was a Swazi. And this Swazi invited me from Durban. This is South Africa says, come. You know, he's calling, the king is calling all the churches. And well, we Muslims, well, we are in also another church, we are Muslims, so he says, we must be also represented. So I said, all right, I'm coming. So I went, and we were accommodated in the king's crawl, open ground, and the debate started. How long is a woman to wait after the demise of her husband for her to remarry? How long? He sat on the ground, in the grass, the morning 7 o'clock, and he's carrying on, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and the Africans, great orators, everyone a potential Billy Graham or Jimmy Swaggart, every one of them, the Africans are born orators. So one comes along, and he makes a point, let's say three months, and everybody says, hooray, hooray. 
Well done. The next guy comes along, he's a Palish. Palish means porridge, means rubbish. What this guy spoke is all rubbish. And he makes a point. Six months. The woman must wait. The next guy comes along, he's a Palish. He's porridge. This is all rubbish. Garbage. What the guy was speaking. And he makes a point, he's a 12 months. And on and on. From seven in the morning, <laughs> no breakfast, no lunch. <laughs> the Africans can take it. <laughs> Our Nigerian brother is here. He's not here tonight. I think he had dinner last night. <laughs> so, my turn came at five in the evening. So I'm telling them, I said, you see, from morning till now, we haven't come to a solution. Reason? I said, you're quoting the Old Testament, you're quoting the New Testament. You're quoting the New Testament, you're quoting the Old Testament. And the answers are not there. You haven't got the answer there. The answer is in the last testament. And I did this. Last testament. And they got the shock. Never heard a word like that before in their life. You see, they know Old Testament, New Testament. Old Testament? Have you heard of a Last Testament? No. We say this is the last testament, the last and final revelation of God to mankind. The answer is here. This is where did this come from? So look, wait, wait. But the answer is here. And you don't have to reason. You don't have to deduce. You don't have to argue. You don't have to debate. The answer is here. And I opened Surah Baqarah, verse number, uh, chapter 2, verse 2 to 3, or something like that. It reads, it reads, If any of you die and leave widows behind, they shall wait concerning themselves four months and ten days. Do you want a, an interpreter for that? You want an alim, shaykh, imam to tell you what it means? Four months and ten days. No arguments. Four months and ten days. When they have fulfilled the term of waiting, the women, there is no blame on you if they dispose themselves in a just and reasonable manner. And God is well acquainted with what he do. There is no blame on you if you make an offer of betrothal to wait to marry or hold it in your hearts. God knows that you cherish them in your hearts. But do not make a secret contract with them except in terms honorable. Nor res resolve on to the marriage tie till the term prescribed is fulfilled. That one verse. It gives you in a nutshell the whole solution. And it proves that this is not the work of man. This is Allah's kalam. It proves that, I'll show you just now, how it does that. You see, four months and ten days, any wise man could have guessed. Your guess is as good as mine. I say four, four months, you say four and a half months. Then one says five months, somebody says four months and ten days. Somebody says four months and five days. Look, it's guesswork. Anybody can guess four months and ten days. Out of a hundred, somebody might hit the jackpot. You agree? Yes. So there's nothing miraculous about that. Somebody say three months, some say three months and ten days. Some say four months, some say four months and ten days. Anybody could have guessed. That does not show that this is Allah's kalam. A man could have guessed. A clever man, he thinks he's reasonable. For divorce, the Quran says, three months. If you divorce a woman, she's got to wait three months to find out whether she's carrying or not. If you start your divorce proceeding, there is a set system. Allah gives it to you in the Quran, Surah Talaq. The bulk of the Muslims of my countries, in the East, Pakistan, India, they don't know Surah Talaq. I don't know about the Arabs. You see whether they know. My people, when they get angry, you come home, the wife has made some samosas, you taste them, insipid. So you tell your wife, he you said, you know, my mother used to make better samosas than you. <laughs> So she says, why didn't you marry your mother? <laughs> so my brothers, you know what they say? Talak, talak, talak. 
This is what he does. He says, talak, talak, talak. So what? Uh, now he regrets. He said, man, she was a good worker. Uh, she worked like a donkey. I can't get even a servant to do that work. You know, at any price. He wants to bring her back. And he goes through some ordeals, filthy, dirty ordeals, wanting to bring her back. Because they don't read the Quran. They don't read the Quran. Allah bari ta'ala goes out of his way. And he's teaching you how to do the job. If you must. The one thing that is acceptable in the sight of God, but most hateful, is divorce. When a man divorces his wife, the Prophet ﷺ said, he said, the heavens and the earth shudder. Horrible thing. But if it must come to, it has to be done. But make a nice clean cut. The way you are taught how to do the job. So you don't have to regret later on. But this is how our people do. Talaq, 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 and then regrets afterwards. Is that how the Arabs do? I don't know. The Iranians, will they do the same? Yes. <laughs> right. So, divorce, three months. You wait. In the procedure, if she's carrying, divorce proceeding stops. She must tell the man, the Quran says, Allah says, she must tell, the her condition, so proceeding stops. So after the child is born, maybe, the man relents or the woman relents. Now she's got a liability. In the marriage market, the value is not the same. She's not the same. So now she might relent. He might give in. And the husband is now, where is this going to go? Where is she going to go with my child? He might also come down from the high pedestal he's sitting on. Look, reconciliation. Possible. So Allah says, do it the system, systematically. Don't do that shotgun, shotgun marriage and shotgun divorce. Da, 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 getting rid of people. Don't do that. However, three months. The reason behind that is biological. This is four months and ten days. I said, your guess is as good as mine. Muhammad's guess could be as good as anybody else's. What's miraculous about that? I said, the miraculous nature of that is that we are told that do not enter into a marriage contract until the term is fulfilled. In the meantime, you can suggest to your sister-in-law, if she is, then I said, look man, my sister-in-law with my brother's children, where is she going to go? Islam allows that you give her protection in marriage. Just protection like this, I can feed her, I can clothe her, yes, for how long? Then you see, man, she's still young, she's beautiful, she's desirable, and you might make mischief, bring disgrace. Why do that? Own up. Islam says, own up. Don't plant, plant wild oats. The Westerner says, no, you must be free to plant, plant as you like. Don't get hitched up. You mustn't marry, but you can plant. You can beget a dozen illegitimate children every year from a dozen women. The law, the, the nations say, you are a stud. You are a great guy. Islam says, no, make the guy responsible for his pleasures. So you tell this widow, he said, look, don't worry, sister. You know, after your term is over, then I'm prepared to marry you. I'll give you protection. In the meantime, here's some help to pay your rent, to feed the children. Oh, the woman will be elated. So, I didn't know that somebody would care for me. With all this liability, this half a dozen children, quarter dozen children, I have lost my looks. So she's very happy, very joyous in that emotional upset. If you call the Imam, the priest, he said, look, she's prepared to marry me. She, can't, she won't say no. Say, you want to marry this man? She says, all right. <laughs> Sign the dotted line. Later on, she finds out, he said, this guy, and he can't hold a job. He was a sadist. He was beating his wife, starving his children. Oh, what has happened? I'm tied up. And there's no way out. Very difficult. Allah knows that. You, you, me, men will take unfair advantage over this helpless woman. So he says, don't you enter into a contract until the term appointed is finished. Give her a chance. Give her a break. Four months and ten days. So in the meantime, she's telling people, he says, you know, Mr. Didat has suggested marriage. You say, what? You know that old man? <laughs> you don't know. <laughs> you don't know what you're bargaining for. <laughs> so, you know, she can think, plan. Say, no. By the time, four months and ten days are over, I say, what do you say? She says, no, no, thank you very much, you know. Very grateful for, you know, doing all this, but I'm quite all right. You know, I'll manage it somehow now. Let, give me a little longer time. In the meantime, she's looking in the marriage. Somebody else might come along. This is Allah's kalam. 
Allah knows the mentality of man, the psychology of man. So he's not only catering for your needs, but he knows your sicknesses too. The unfair advantages that you're going to take over helpless women, emotional women. I will give you protection. And she says she falls for it. I said, no, no, wait. No contract until four months and ten days are over. This is how Allah gives you solutions. Then when you read, you, you study, he said, no, this is not the work of man. This is not Muhammad's handiwork. Then you realize, this is the work of an omniscient being. He knows your mentality, our psychology, everything, and is catering for your needs. And you find anything, everything. This is how the Quran works, Allah's Quran works. One verse freed us from four evils. One verse. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ya ayyuhal lazina amun. Say, oh you who believe. Oh men of faith. Innamal khamru. Most certainly intoxicants. Wal maisiru and gambling. Wal ansabu and fortune telling. Wal azlamu and idol worship. Rizum min amali shaitan. Are an abomination of Satan's handiwork. Fajtanibuhu la'allakum tuflihun. So shun such abomination that he may prosper. Prosper. Four evils. Cut at the very roots. One verse. The Holy Prophet Muhammad said, whatever intoxicates in greater quantity is forbidden even in smaller quantity. No excuse for a nip or a tot or one percent beer. No excuse. This is how Allah teaches. And it has. I know some of our brethren bring disgrace to us. When we are talking to them, I said, look, Islam, when I was talking to this lady, Gina Lewis, he said, yes, Mr. D, Dad, you know, it all sounds very nice, you know, the teachings of Islam, but you know. <laughs> then she gives me examples. She said, you know, I go into a certain car where I go, you know, where there do a lot of boozing and... He says, you know, you Arab brothers. She says, make me to put my head down in shame. Yes, Arab brothers, Pakistani brothers, we are all weak. But as a people as a whole, still we can hold our head high. As a people as a whole, there are a thousand million Muslims in the world and as a people, as a whole, we don't take that stuff. It is our children who have been spoiled by you, the Westerners. They, we send them to your universities, in your environment, your girls were freer to, to play with, you know, going to the dance, this, that, that, and you want to ply her with alcohol so you can weaken her resistance, so you have to also play the tune, you have to also imbibe, and you can become alcoholic. This is a sickness, See, it's a disease. Some of us, we have it in our metabolism, that the first sip will land you, in the gut, land you in the gutter. You know that? Safety lies in abstinence. And the only religion on the face of the earth which says, don't touch that abomination is Islam. So it's your problem. What creates the biggest society of teetotals in the world? All the born-again Christians, 75 million born-again Christians in America. That nation with one-third of its people born-again angels. They say they sin no more. One-third, 75 million. Says, Jimmy Swag, uh, says Billy Graham in his book, How to be Born Again. One third. And this is having no effect on the people. 55 million drunkards. In a nation with 75 million born again. And Jesus Christ said, a little leaven, leaven at the whole. You need a little yeast to ferment the whole loaf. You don't need so much yeast. A little bit. But if you have one third yeast, and if it doesn't ferment the loaf, I was telling the Americans, I said, there's something wrong with your yeast. Or something wrong with your flour. No? One third yeast and still it doesn't work. With us, we have our shortcomings. We are not angels. But let us be exemplars. Let us preach. Because when you start speaking, it is conducive to us changing our own lives. You can't benefit. I mean, you can't change. You will be changing. By talking good to others, it must have influence upon your life. It will. Unless you are an out and right rank hypocrite. Which I think there are very few like that in the world. So with these words, Mr. Chairman uh, and my brothers and sisters, I take leave from this talk and I pray that may Allah bari ta'ala make us to meet again. Uh, and for the time being, if you have any questions, I'm at your disposal. Wa akhiru da'wan and alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. As you have said, uh, there is a plenty of evidence of Prophet or Prophet, Hazrat Muhammad, peace be upon him, in uh, Semitic religions. Have you come across any such reference 
Yes, I had read a book by Maulana Vidyarthi, Muhammad in World Scriptures, and he gives numerous uh, proofs, quotations from the Vedas and the other books of the Hindus. But uh, since now, this is really not a problem. Like in my country, the Hindus, they don't know anything about the Vedas. If I ask a Hindu whether he has read the Ramayana, he says no. Whether he's read the Bhagavad Gita, he says no. Whether he's seen a Veda, he says no. So therefore, it is not profitable to waste time about a thing which the man knows nothing about. In other words, now we must teach him about the Vedas. And before we say, now look, in the Vedas there's such and such a thing. So therefore, I have not dealt with that aspect. It was your question, yes. Therefore, I don't deal with that aspect simply because there is no need. That type of clientele is not there. Mr. D, that you have demonstrated that the early Christians were in the habit of translating, either translating proper names or changing or Hellenizing or Latinizing proper names. Like you have demonstrated, they have translated, uh, you know, or changed the, 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 the proper name Jesus, Esau into Jesus and Cephas into Peter. So I think probably it would be very useful, you know, for the other people if you could touch we can assume, I mean, you have demonstrated actually that in English, only in English, in, in, in the various versions of the Bible, you have three, the three names, three translations of, of the person who is spoken of in the, in the verse of John which you have read. One is advocate, one is uh, uh, comforter, and the other one is a counselor. And I mean, in my knowledge, in my reading of, of some comparative religion, I, I know that, I, that the Greek word is, par, is parakletos. I have also read in some Islamic literature, or some Muslim scholars assume that the original word, which I also assume the Greek word parakletos, which must have been translated either from Aramaic or Hebrew, that in turn it has been either distorted or deliberately changed by the early Christians so that, would, that they would preclude any prophecies after Jesus. Could you possibly elaborate a little bit on the word parakletos? Because I have read that it's, it was supposed to be parakletos, which means the praised one. Could you please elaborate for the benefit of those people who have yes. something to say about this? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Now in the current Greek scriptures, the word there is parakletos. Parakletos, which is, means comforter, it can be translated advocate, it can be translated counselor. But in classical Greek there is no such word as parakletos. The classical Greek is perikletos. And perikletos means the exact translation of Muhammad, the praised one. So this is what our scholars say, see, that the word ought to be perikletos and not parakletos. And it is an ex perikletos is an exact translation. Muhammad, the praised one, perikletos meaning the praised one. I hope that clarifies your question, yes. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar I will seek your indulgence to ask a small... A little louder, so people can hear. There is a small point which I wanted a clarification on and an elaboration upon. I, during my study of this subject which you had taken up, had come across two particular predictions uh, <clears throat> which I vaguely remember now which you can elaborate upon because of your uh, intense and extensive knowledge of uh, the Bible and the Old Testament. In two instances wherein the advent of Prophet Muhammad is mentioned in either the Old or the New Testament. One is the geographical location in Faran which is mentioned uh, in the Bible, in, 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 in the Testament. And the other is a mention of seven thunders, which is, which I read in a commentary, refers to the seven verses of Surah Fatiha. Now, if you kindly, if I, I, I recollect these two instances correctly, if you could kindly elaborate upon these two instances. Thank you. I think I remember saying at the outset that there are numerous prophecies in the Bible. There is a mention about 10,000 saints. There is about Kedah, 
which is Arabia, the tribes of uh, the, the, the Quraysh, and so on. There are numerous prophecies in the Bible as it exists regarding Islam and regarding the Holy Prophet Muhammad. But I believe that it is not profitable to generalize like that. To say, oh, they are numerous, and I say, it's this one, and that one, and that one, and that one. You give one, you give two, and you prove your case. He says, now let us reason about this now. Does this convince you? It fits Muhammad like a glove. Where is your candidate? In the book of Deuteronomy, we have another. I have written a book on the subject. The whole book is based on that one verse from the book of Deuteronomy. But we never dealt with it at all tonight. What for? That itself calls for an hour's lecture. So this one an hour, that one an hour, another it's three hours, four hours, five hours, just talking about prophecies, I'll make you drunk with knowledge. You see, it's not profitable that way. Rather, take one thing, prove your case. Take one thing, and I take this subject, Deuteronomy 18.18. It says that I will raise them up a prophet from among the brethren, like unto thee, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. The same thing in Arabic. In Hebrew, Navi Akim Lahim Mikari Ah. So look, if you deal with that, then you deal with that. If you deal with this, you deal with that. But you start generalizing, you say, you know, this one too, and that one too. The guy says, No man, you are no, you know, this is too far fetched. Everything is too far-fetched. So you want, make one claim, stake your claim. You got this, then say, look, look at this one. He says, yes, that's proved your point there. And said, look at this one. And we prove our point, but you won't need all that. If there is a sincere person, sincere at heart, you proved your one case, he wants to know further, what did he teach? Let me see. What does the book say? And Allah will open his eyes. But if the person doesn't want to, you're wasting time. You give a hundred prophecies, a thousand prophecies, Jesus Christ with a thousand prophecies to his backing. That the Messiah is coming. The Jews re re rejected him. Thousand prophecies and miracle working, giving life to the dead, walking on the water. All. Healing the lepers, the blind. What, what a way. Nothing. See, the thing is now, stake your claim. Make a point. Prove it. And now let's see the reaction. Where does the man want to go from here? And if it need be, ask yes, look, there is a book called Muhammad in the Bible, actually, by Kaldani. Abdul Ahad Kaldani. He was a Syrian priest who had become Muslim. Fantastic. Very concentrated. It needs people like my brother who was here. You must read that, digest that, and start sharing with ordinary people. You see, it's concentrated work. Muhammad in the Bible by Qadani. And you can deliver a dozen lectures from there on the subject of Bible prophecy. But to, to me, I feel that one thing at a time. Prove your case. Whatever it is, prove your case. More profitable than a dozen suggestions. So this is mine, this is mine, that is mine, that is mine. Everything belongs to me. They say, no, no, no. You just put your claim and say, look, this clause here refers to me. This is my stake. Please, as you said the, the other night, that there is no an iota of difference between the fundamental teaching of Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad. But we all know, we all know now that there is a fundamental difference between the three mentioned religions. Would you please tell us when, where, and how this difference occurred? And the when I said there is not an iota, the question was, that I had said, I think at the first meeting, that there is an, not an iota, one jot, one tittle, one dot of difference between the teaching, the fundamentals of the teachings of Moses, Jesus and Muhammad. And the brother wants to know that now where, today we know there are differences. Where did the differences arise? Well, with regards to Judaism, I mean, the concept of God, except for saying that you know they have certain concept which is not coming far enough but it was given to them according to the background and experience according to the needs they are still a monotheistic people they believe in oneness of god 
with regards to the Christians, they have deviated away from the path. You see, Jesus Christ taught the unity of God. He said, Shama Israel Adonai Elohainu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Finish. He repeated what Moses had given 1300 years before. No difference. But now where did the Trinity come from? You see, the pagan world around Palestine, the Romans and the Greeks, they had the men gods beyond counting. Around the time when Jesus walked this earth, these people, they worshipped many gods. They had the Trinity. Who? The Romans had the Trinity. They had a Trinity as is Apollo, Venus, Horus. Oh, they had their men gods beyond counting. Uh, they had their um, Jupiter, the god of heaven, Pluto, the god of hell, Vulcan, the god of fire, Neptune, the god of the sea, Mars, the god of war. And Zeus was the father of all these many gods with his many wives and many children sitting on some planet. And from there he was sending his sons into the world. As the need arose, his Apollo, his Horus, his Isis, his Osiris. See, this was pure mythology, sheer mythology, fairy tale. But a people who believe in fairy tales, fairy tales are not fairy tales. These are realities. So among such a people goes this new religion, a new teaching of Jesus Christ, that the Son of God, metaphorical, a Son of God has come into in Palestine. So what was metaphorical to the Jew became literal to the Greek. And they became the pioneers of that message to the Western world. So today the Christian world is looking at a Jewish scripture. Jewish scripture, Jewish language, a Hebrew idiom and metaphors through Greek glasses, as the Greeks saw it. So they saw Trinity with there's no Trinity. They saw plurality with there's no plurality. This is the problem. The problem was created at the Council of Nisi in 325, where they declared Jesus Christ to be God incarnate, God in human form. This was democratically passed at a synod meeting of the bishops in 325, 325 years after Jesus. The only God who was democratically elected was Jesus Christ. You see? So that is where it started in the year 325. I don't know whether brother is who asked the question. You see what oh, yes. that, that is my knowledge. How, that's how hard it goes. Yes. Cool. Did that. After your uh, three lectures, uh, we can understand that is, it is easy to understand that the message is the same for all the human uh, kind. You have experience with the priests. Why the priests are not able to understand that? And if they understand that, why do they never speak with the people with this simple logic? I think there are two difficulties. Why the learned man, in any religion, he doesn't see the truth. You see, he does the learned man. He opposes truth bitterly. You see, the people, if you read the Bible, you find that the people who opposed Moses, who were they? They were the leaders of the Bani Israel. See, every man feels that, look, am I not better than this fellow? You know, this man is a scatterer, man. You know, he's a renegade from the law. We run away. And now God chooses him. Resistance. Jesus Christ. Same. Resistance. Who is this upstart, young fellow? What is he? What does he? What? No, look, we are the learned people. We are the leaders of the Sanhedrin. And this young man is telling us, you know, where to get off. The Holy Prophet Muhammad. Same. Abu Jahl. Resistance. Abu Jahl. You know what it means? Father of ignorance. And yet that man was one of the clever, cleverest of the Arabs. He was one of the very few persons, you can, people whom you can count on your fingertips who could read and write. His real title was Abul Hikm, father of wisdom. He's the wisest of the Arabs. Why does he resist? Why does he reject? Same, jealousy comes in. You see, his awwal sin, the first sin, shaitan, jealous. Am I not better than him? He is made of dust, I am made of fire, why should I bow down to him? Same, it's an eternal thing with man, jealousy. You see? Jealousy comes in. This man, son of Abdullah, an orphan, a camel driver, 
and a goat herd. He was looking after his uncle Abu Talib's goats. And now he says, God chose him. <laughs> God couldn't see me. <laughs> uh, this man can't even write. He can't even sign his name and God wasn't chooses him. Imagine. <laughs> so this is, this is man, the nature of man, the learned man. Vested interest comes in. Pride comes in. It's hard. It is hard. You see, unless you bring a lowly spirit, a humble spirit, it is very difficult to accept truth. This is the pride of man that makes him to do that. Shaitan yet, you know, the devilishness. <laughs> Am I not better than him? <laughs> May I ask two questions if I have time? Yes, one, of, uh, one will be of, a, I would say, a doctrinal nature, the other of an ethical nature. The, the first one, uh, it is known, and you stressed it very eloquently and in a scholarly way, that uh, there is great convergence between the Bible and the Holy Quran in, let's say, matters concerning the past, for instance, creation, Adam and Eve, and Abraham, and Noah, and so on. But there is also great convergence concerning the, the future. In both books, there is, uh, to my knowledge, heavy stress on what's called, I think, in both books, the last days, the days of judgment. Uh, in the Bible, it's the object of the final book, which is a book of Revelation, which describes an end to uh, human history. And uh, I know if I, I didn't, I didn't, <coughs> I didn't bring a Quran with myself, but if uh, if I had the Holy Quran here, if I had an index, I would be able to point to many. Uh, verses which describe the period of the last days of the days of judgment. So my question is, I would like to ask you how this uh, end to histo of history, this period of judgment, is seen today by Islamic scholars and by the Islamic scholar that you yourself are. <laughs> that was my first question. Tell me, uh, uh, one question. All right. Yeah. Uh, the question I think you have heard very, very clearly about uh, the Bible speaking about the end of days, Yawmul Qiyama, the Quran speaks about Yawmul Qiyama, the last days. There is some kind of common grounds between the two and uh, the question was, I think, what does the Quran say? If our brother, he says, if he had a Quran with an index, he might have been able to give those references. Here it is, I have a Quran with an index, and it speaks about the hereafter, or last day, doomsday. It speaks about it here, the day of judgment. As a matter of fact, one third of the Quran deals with this subject. One third. Heaven and hell, hereafter, day of judgment, all these verses when they're put together, about one third of the Quran. But uh, today it looks like bulk of uh, the learned men, they don't want to make people, you know, uh, this is terrified, because it is quite a terrifying thought, you know, that your doomsday, my doomsday is very close. You see, the realistic person, he doesn't go into wanting to know when, today, tomorrow, next year, five years time, ten years time, because I personally, I feel and I believe that my doomsday, my end of time is the moment I close my eyes, is the moment I die. Finish. Why should I worry whether this earth is going to last another million years or not? Or another thousand years? How is that going to help me? Suppose I knew that tomorrow 12 o'clock the earth is coming to an end. How will that help me? What will I start doing? Will I start saying hallelujah, 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 subhanallah, subhanallah, so what am I going to start doing? Will I start making out a will when the will will be used? What am I going to do? So the Holy Prophet Muhammad, I think, he puts us all to rest with regards to that problem. In one of his sayings, Hadith, he said that if you were to plant a fruit tree today, 
and the sure knowledge reaches you that tomorrow 12 noon is doomsday, Qayama will be established. Everything will be wiped out. What must you do? He said, plant the fruit tree. God will reward you for that. But tomorrow 12 o'clock, you know, it will take seven years and the coconut palm will take 20 years before it, there's a coconut. You know, that 20 years tree. 20 years it takes. Mango trees, from seedling, seven years. But you plant it, to, you're supposed to plant today and tomorrow 12 o'clock will be all wiped out. He said, plant it. In other words, behave naturally. This is the message. The message is as if you're going to live for that moment. You don't have to start starting, you know, going down into prostration now, making sujood. Subhanallah, Subhanallah, Subhanallah. Glory to God, glory to God. How is that going to help you now? All your life, what you have been doing, and now all of a sudden you'll say, for half a day, eight hours, you say, Subhanallah, Subhanallah. No. Behave naturally, normally. And uh, I think because of that philosophic idea, that the Muslim is not overawed with Qayama. Let it come. We must be ever ready. At any given moment, we know we are in tune with our Lord. This is, is the prerequisite. Any given moment, Malakal mouth come, the angel of death comes along, says, take my soul, take my soul. I should be ever ready at any time. I don't have to start getting worried. The Christians have been, you know, false ideas have been created up. Immediately after Jesus, people, they didn't want to buy properties. They didn't want to do farming. Even today, the Jehovah's Witnesses. You know, in my country, in South Africa, the Jehovah's Witnesses, they are all aspiring to buy the land around Stellenbosch. You know, there's wineries and breweries, you know, you have this all those vineyards. They are waiting. The most valuable land in South Africa is around there in the Cape. They are waiting for doomsday to be established so that they will rule and they'll have all the land. For the moment, they're not interested. They won't build orphanages, they won't build hospitals. It creates that type of mentality. Anytime now, so what must you do? Why must you work? Why must you improve? No. Islam says, you work as if you're going to live forever. Carry on. And when the time comes, you go. But the subject is dealt with quite extensively in the Quran. That it's a reality. It is no joke. Hell is no joke. See? And when you read that, it does have an effect on your life. You mend your life. But the one with the index is here. If you want to make references to it, you may. Heaven, look, hell, uh, hereafter, and day of judgment. I have, in fact, three questions. Two pertains, two pertains to your present lecture, and perhaps one is a very odd one. My first question is that the last testimony does indicate, or I will rephrase my question, does the last testimony indicates about any messenger or it is indicated by Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam that any messenger in any form will come after him? My number two question is what will be that? One question at a time. Okay. I think it's only fair. You see, this is a very old machine. 70 years old. You pose three questions and by the time I start answering one, I think I answered the lot. Then so you see this guy is now, you know, he's trying to get away with it. So therefore I said one at a time, you ask a question, I can digest that and I can give you if I have some knowledge and then when your turn comes again, I will answer again. So there is no reference in the Quran with regards to the coming of any messenger. Another prophet. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is Khatim al nabiyin He is the seal of the prophets, the last of the prophets. And there shall be no prophets after him. That's the message in the Quran. That is the message that a thousand million Muslims have understood. New chairman and the auditor, I have a question about um, a prophecy of the Old Testament found in Isaiah 53. And there it speaks of a servant who will come and bear our transgressions, be smitten by God, um, and who, through whom, who, th whose sufferings we will find healing for our transgressions. In other words, forgiveness for, of sins. So my question is, um, whose person does it speak of, either Muhammad or, or Yeshua, that we can find transgressions uh, through, 
And who is able to forgive sins if it's God alone? My point is that uh, it's only through um, an incarnation of God that we can find forgiveness uh, of sin, which this verse is talking about, uh, this servant who is bearing our sins. See, if the term that is used, that the servant, then at the same time, our brother says, that it will be an incarnation of God. That means God himself coming down, taking human form. Now, God can't be his own servant. I don't know whether you, you can see the contradiction there. God comes down to earth and he's his own servant. It doesn't make sense. How can he be his own servant? He says, in the Bible, if your Bible, if you know, I don't know whether you have a different Bible from the one that I got here, the Roman Catholic version, the King James version, the Revised version, they all say the very same thing. In the book of Isaiah, same book that you're quoting, God says, I, I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is no Savior besides me. He says again, I forgive sins for my own sake. That's his saying. For my own sake. It's not because you, know, you give me something, a sheep or a goat or a lamb, or you sacrifice somebody, a, a good man or a bad man. No, for my own sake. If he says he can do it for his own sake, and he has been doing it all along, that is his law. He told Moses, if you remember, your scripture, this is uh, Moses, when the children of Israel took the golden calf for worship, and God was wrought with them, angry with them. He wanted to dis destroy them. So Moses goes before God and he makes a plea. He makes a double request. He said, Lord, I know that these people have sinned a great sin in thy sight. They deserve destruction. But forgive them. If not, blot me out of thy book. Means forget me. Blot me out. Destroy me. I can't see my people being destroyed. I know they have sinned, I know they deserve destruction, but this is my request. Forgive them or block me out. The reply, God answers the second request first. Amazing. He says, forgive or, for, or block me out. God says, I will block him out who has sinned against me. This is my law. Why should he catch an innocent man? Jesus Christ, an innocent man, have him hang for your sins. Is that his law? Is that his law? Is that what he does? No, he gives you. Jesus Christ himself is telling you. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. There is no heaven for you unless you are better than the Jew. He didn't say unless you believe that I am going to die for you. Did he say that? That you believe that I... Look, if that was the teaching, if that was God's plan, for 4,000 years he has been wasting his time. He should have started from the very beginning. He said, my son Jesus, I'm going to send him in the year 4,000 after Adam and he's going to die for the sins of mankind. The whole lot of you, you Jews, you got to believe. If you want to have salvation, you got to believe that my son is going to redeem you. Instead, this God is telling them that they must fast and they must pray and they must eschew idolatry and adultery. What for? If there was an easier way, God has been most unjust for 4,000 years. For 4,000 years, he's making people to pay the price, sweat and toil. And this is what Solomon in his book of Ecclesiastes, he says, he is advising you and me and every one of us with regards to true faith, true behavior. He says, and further, by this my son be admonished. Learn a lesson from this. Of making many books, there is no end. All your excuses, your rationalizations, he says there is no end to them. Of making many books, there is no end. And much study is a weariness of the flesh. It's going to tire you. You're going to study Shintoism. You're going to study Hinduism. You're going to study Zoroastrianism. You're going to study Islamism. This is by the way, I'm using terms. And then I'm going to come to a conclusion. What I'm going to do? He says, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. 
So let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. It says, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Fear God, that there is God, and you are obligated to him. He has set the rules and regulations for you. Carry that out. Keep the commandments of God. And Jesus says the very same thing. Unless you are better than the Jew, there is no heaven for you. He said, he is not of me, who does not take his cross and follow me. Take up your cross and follow me. Take your cross up and follow. You don't want to take up the cross. You don't want to carry the burden. You want Jesus to carry it for you. You have VD and you want to give Jesus injections. You have AIDS and you want to treat Jesus. What's wrong? He says this is not the way. You carry your own burden. Don't be a coward man. You go and enjoy with prostitutes and Jesus pays the price. Does it make sense? No, it's the most ridiculous idea. Major Yeats Brown, in his book called Life of a Bengal Lancer, he says, No heathen tribe has ever conceived so grotesque an idea, a filthy, dirty idea, involving as it does the assumption that man was born with a hereditary stain upon him, and that this stain for which he was not personally responsible was to be at atoned for. And the creator of all things had to sacrifice his only begotten son to neutralize his mysterious curse. He says, no heathen tribe has ever conceived such nonsensical idea. But the masters of the world, man who lands on the moon, he is talking this. How can he be wrong? How can he be wrong? The American, how can he be wrong? The Swiss and the French and the German, how can they be wrong? This is it. Inferiority complexes. But where's your common sense? Is this what God expects from you? You go and enjoy yourself, commit sins, so Swagar says. He says, you don't have to do any works. James says in the Bible, faith without work is dead. He says, work, if you depend upon work, he says the sacrifice was worthless. Jesus dying was worthless. He paid the full price. What must you do now? You go, you just behave as you like. The greater the sin, the greater the sacrifice acceptance. Hitler destroyed 6 million Jews and 20 million, 40 million other people died. You think Jesus died in vain? Not for him. Why not? Then, then his worth sacrifice is worth it. For Hitler. <laughs> you see, that question was begging the question actually. Book of Isaiah says certain thing. Now you start now opening the book of Isaiah and start reading it and going into it and wasting time. But on the face of it, we can see that this is the most nonsensical idea. Most nonsensical. It is not the teaching of Christ. Christ told us. He gave us the parable of the prodigal son, in which he illustrates the relationship between God and mankind. The prodigal son. Where is that brother who was asking that question? Where is he? He's at the back. Yes. The prodigal son, if you remember. Who is the father in the parable? God. And the two sons, you and me, one of them is very pious, stays with the father, whatever God says, in other words, he's doing it. The other guy wants his inheritance, his patrimony, he wants to go out into the world and make a good, have a good time. So he tells the father, he said, look, give me what belongs to me. And the father gives it to him. And he goes and joins bad company. And he drinks and gambles and what, what else he does and goes into the gutter. In that condition, he realizes that had he been with the father, he would have been better off. So he makes up his mind to return. That's you and me. He wants to return to the father. And when he returns to the father and the father sees him from afar, he cries out. He says, this my son was dead, is now alive. He was lost, is now found. Was he dead? No. no. Spiritually, he had gone away from the father. Spiritually dead, yes. Physically, he was still alive through and through. So this, my son, is making a comeback. So he tells the other son, sacrifice the fatted calf for the homecoming of the prodigal. Celebration. I'm asking whose calf was that? The father's. So the father is prepared, means God Almighty, is prepared to make his own sacrifice for the return of the sinner. You make up your mind, God is prepared to accept you with open arms. That's what Jesus is showing. This is what it means. God will accept you with open arms and he is prepared to make the sacrifice. He doesn't tell you, he says, look, you wasted, squandered my money. You must stay with the pigs for six years, seven years, and then I will take you on to become a goat herd or a sheep herd, and then I will take you into the house. 
This is not, this is not Shiloh. As soon as you make up your mind, but the soul that will turn, return from the sins that he has committed and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. This is the law. Not Jesus dying for your sins or Muhammad dying. Nobody dies for your sin. You pay for your own sin. Be a man. Don't be a coward. We are back to the original uh, number of three questions, uh, but I just would like to make uh, a small remark. Please, no applause. Mr. Dudat doesn't need it, and I know it is a spontaneous expression on your part, but still try to control yourselves with applause. Thank you. I thank you for your previous answer, which I will meditate. Uh, now my second question is of, um, I would say, an ethical nature. It's connected with the previous one. Uh, in the meantime, before the uh, end of history, which we talked about before, we live in history, and we have to deal with um, human defects or sins which are very old, such as uh, selfishness or deceit. And we see in, uh, in particular in the present stage of history which we live in some problems which are typical of our times, uh, problems of the difference of uh, income between men and nations, problems of the... To take an example, today all over the, news, <coughs> the press <coughs> and the TV, I suppose, in Geneva and probably much of the world, you have this story, the event of the decrease of the price of coffee. Uh, <coughs> the consequences of phenomena of that kind, we know, those uh, pe millions of people who are very poor will see their income decrease and uh, while those who are richer won't, uh, won't uh, have uh, lesser income. And we have problems, uh, well this is an example, we have problems like this, we see very often, especially in the city uh, where we live, we see the problem of the treatment of um, foreigners, of uh, strangers, and um, expulsion of uh, people of certain nationalities and so on. And we, we see those problems of that kind every day, those kinds every day in the newspapers. And uh, my question is, you gave us before examples of uh, practical wisdom of Islam and of the Quran, in, especially in matters of matrimony, uh, divorce and the remarriage. Uh, my question is, um, do we find in the Holy Quran or in Islamic theology uh, teachings of uh, practical wisdom uh, to face the, those problems which are typical of the world in which we live in this generation? Could you give us a few examples? Give me something specific to work upon. The price of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> like another natural economy. All right, <laughs> there is a danger. Uh, maybe I'm going to specify my question a little bit. One of the examples I took was the price of coffee. It so happens that in Christian theology, and the theology of the Middle Ages, and I'm going to take the example of Thomas Aquinas, you have long dissertations about the fixing of just prices. And in the, in the uh, European Middle Ages, that had a certain reality. Uh, the prices of bread and so on were fixed according to certain uh, ethical norms. But it seems that it's much more absent in uh, it's much more absent in the 20th century, especially in the relationships between uh, between nations, rich nations and poor nations. For instance, in the matter which I mentioned before probably one will be able to read uh, dozens of newspapers articles about uh, the decrease of the price of coffee and its uh, sad consequences, but probably without any ethical or theological reference. Whereas uh, Christian theology actually is full of those uh, references, but they are just not quoted. They are just not quoted. So my question, maybe I will repeat it in a way that's, 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 that's less clear now, could you give us maybe one or two examples of um, the practical 
uh, wisdom of uh, the Holy Quran and possibly Islamic theology facing problems which are typical of the days in which we live. Thank you very much. You see, I am not an economist, nor am I a theologian. I am a person who has been talking, talking about religion, I will become a proper, a lecturer in comparative religion. But I might, you know, hazard a guess in telling that, look, the Islamic system, you see, it gives us certain basic rules on which to fix prices. For example, say the end, at the end of the month of fasting, Ramadan, we give a certain charity called Fitra. That is the term that's applied, Fitra. And this Fitra, we calculate, I think, certain weight of wheat. Is it? Can anybody give it to me? No, yeah, what, what, what weight is that? Right. No, no, that's not in money, in, 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 in weight of wheat. Right. So two and a half kilo of wheat. So whatever the price ruling at the time, suppose you, you don't have to go and look for wheat, because the man might not need wheat, he might need rice. He prefers rice to wheat. But we take the value of that wheat, two and a half kilo, and give it to the poor. So a price is fixed. Whether now that wheat is 50 francs, two and a half kilo, or whether it is five francs, or whether it is 500 francs, whatever the price goes up, that is the compulsory charity each and every Muslim must give at the end of the month of fasting. So here it is. And in the early Muslim empire, if you had a bag of wheat in Timbuktu, and you left that bag of wheat there, said, so look, you can sell, and you, can, you have a, uh, your business in China, I will get a bag of wheat there. That's how it worked. And the same thing was suggested, I think, by Iran to the West. He says, look, let us fix the price of oil. On the basis, this, let's come to a, a, an agreement. Oil today, what is it worth? He says, $30, $20, whatever it is. How many loaves of bread can we buy in, in Germany for that? Now, that's fixed now. How many loaves can we buy in England? How many loaves can we get for the $20 today? How many can we get in Geneva for the $20? So that, that is fixed. So if your price of bread goes up, the price of my oil goes up, in keeping with that. But now it doesn't suit the West. You see, they're playing games. How they can, you know, drop this fellow by, you know, these cartels and what and what not. Now this is for the economists, you know, to deal with. But this is the simple principle laid down by Islam. And it is more practical than Thomas Aquinas, you know, all this dissertation that he has written, which nowhere is the first time in my life, I'm 70 year old, I hear about Aquinas having written it. No Christian worth the name has ever spoken about it in 70 years of my living. This is how good it is. You know, Aquinas. These are only scholars in the universities, they know about Aquinas and what he did and what he said, but no Christian knows about it either. There's something which is beating my mind, and uh, is that the Bible uh, is used by Christians. And this very book has given birth to so many churches. And uh, I remember when I was, I was a Christian before, I was a presbyter because my parents are uh, like that. And uh, later I deserted and then joined Jehovah's Witness. Now what we used to do is that we take the Bible, go back to my colleagues uh, who, who are presbyters, then we use the same Bible to prove them wrong, that their principles are wrong. And, uh, and so, but I can see that uh, Brother D that uh, uh, spent much of his time on the Bible. And uh, I don't know if you advised me to, to do the same thing. Uh, because I feel that my common sense tells me that if the Bible, like uh, the Holy Quran, all Muslims, any time they are about to pray, at least everybody have to say uh, Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim, uh, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Rahman, and the rest. 
so that we have everything is unison. So that alone tells me that the Quran is giving the right guidance. But the Bible has given birth to not less than a thousand churches. Which, which tells me, I mean, it beat my imagination. But I can see that uh, he spent much of his time on it. So if you would advise Abdul Razak to, to follow suit. Thank you. You get these books of mine, these books of mine, you know, there's a, a pamphlet is available, take it. You have my name and address, you know, I think they have the pamphlets here, anybody who wants it. And you can write for this literature of ours, inshallah, will be able to help you yeah. in your work. Yes. We now, we now come to the last question. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to ask my question. In fact, this was related to my first question. I want to know the status of Christ as a prophet when he will come again. I don't know what you actually have in mind, but I, if I'm right, that in his second coming now, will he be as a prophet enacting new laws and new regulations? If that is what you have in your mind, then I say no. You see, once you qualify, you become a BA, you become an MA, Master of Arts, that is your title. When you come and you start from kindergarten again, that BA that you have acquired or MA you have acquired, that title can't be taken away from you, you had earned it. So Jesus Christ is Jesus Christ, he still remains Jesus Christ. He is a prophet, but he's got no jurisdiction in this new dispensation. This is the dispensation of Muhammad. No prophet, new or old, can come along and contradict anything that has been said already in the Quran. Because the Quran, Allah tells us in the Quran, Al yawma akmaltu lakum din. This day I have perfected for you your religion. If you believe that, we believe that. That Islam is perfected that day. Finish, no more. We don't need anything. We don't want Jesus to come along and tell us, now nah, you can eat the pig because it is now brought up under hygienic conditions. Or now nah, you can drink a little because look, everybody is drinking anyhow. And dancing is common. So I can't tell you you can't dance because then you all run away from religion. And everybody is committing adultery. So what can I say? No, no. Whatever is laid down here is finished. Absolutely. Nothing can be added to this, nothing can be deleted from here. So whatever his status, is, he is the Messiah, yes. we can't take his title away. He was Rasul and Ilabani Israel, you can't take the title away. He's there. As long as the Quran is there, the title remains. So in his second coming, he's still Jesus. But he's got no power. See, like a king. He abdicates. A new king takes his place and this man comes again. He's a king. He was King Richard the Lionhearted, but he's got no say. Am I right? The one that's ruling now, his law prevails. Now man is the, the king and a dozen kings from the past comes along. There are no kings, but the king title remains. Sultan so-and-so, Sultan so-and-so, King so-and-so, Messiah so-and-so, but he's got no power. He's got no power to change the law that is current. I would like to thank you all. As Brother Dubai said yesterday, let the book speak. And when the book speaks, all humanity and all creation listens. I would be like a shaitan regime, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Pull Alhamdulillah, Wasalam Allah Ibadi Hiladina Stafa. الله خير أما يشركون أما خلق السماوات والأرض وأنزل لكم من السماء ماء فأنبتنا به حضائق ذات بهجة ما كان لكم أن تنبتوا شجرها أإله مع الله بل هم قوم يعدلون أما جعل الأرض قرارا وجعل خلالها أنهارا وجعل لها رواسي وجعل بين البحرين حاجزا أإله مع الله بل أكثرهم لا يعلمون أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه 
ويكشف السوء ويجعلكم خلفاء الأرض أإله مع الله قليلا ما تذكرون أمن يهديكم في ظلمات البر والبحر ومن يرسل الرياح بشرا بين يدي رحمته أإله مع الله تعالى الله عما يشركون أمن يبدأ الخلق ثم يعيده ومن يرزقكم من السماء والأرض أإله مع الله قل هاتوا برهانكم إن كنتم صادقين I'll say the same thing in English for those who don't follow Arabic. <coughs> it is one way of rendering it. As you know, it is very difficult to translate Quran into English. All translations are just one way, a possible way of saying a few things of what is in the original Arabic. Say, praise be to Allah and peace on his servants whom he has chosen for his message. Who is better, Allah or the false gods they associate with him? Or who has created the heaven and the earth? And who sends you down rain from the sky? Yea, with it we cause to grow well-planted orchards full of beauty and delight. Is it not in your, it is not in your power to cause the growth of the trees in them. Can there be another God besides God? Nay, they are people who swerve from justice. Or who has made the earth firm to live in, made rivers in its midst, set there on mountains immovable, and made a separating bar between the two bodies of flowing water, can there be another God besides Allah? Nay, most of them know not. Or who listens to the soul distressed when it calls on him, and who relieves its suffering and makes you mankind inheritors of the earth? Can there be another God besides Allah? Little it is that ye heed. Or who guides you through the depth of darkness on land and sea? And who sends the winds as heralds of glad tidings going before his mercy? Can there be another God besides Allah? High is Allah above what they associate with him. Or who originates creation, then repeats it, and who gives you sustenance from heaven and earth? Can there be another God besides Allah? Say, bring forth your argument if you are telling the truth. Thank you very much. I give the floor now to the chairman to, for the concluding remark of this series of lectures. Brothers and sisters, I think we have heard enough and we have got enough within ourselves to contemplate upon. May God bless this evening, these evenings. May He, capital H, guide our hearts, forgive us our sins, bring us together, and make the best day of our lives the day we meet him. Brother Didat, you are leaving tomorrow for Umrah. Please pray for us there. Goodbye. Happy landing. God be with you. God bless you. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.